Good morning, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to see you, and we thank the Lord for this beautiful day and for bringing us together to learn Him. Welcome also to everyone online. It's wonderful to have you here. Out of the eater came something to eat, out of the powerful, something sweet. Let us pray. Our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you and we thank you for every gift that you give us. And today we turn our minds to that most precious gift, the word and your life, the source of all life. Let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Today we're going to learn about the story of Samson, one of the most powerful stories in the word for many reasons, which we will see. And the first thing of note that reveals that Samson is not a normal human being, but has superhuman strength, like a superhero, is when he is walking to meet the woman he wishes to marry. And I'm going to read that to you. Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Then Samson continued on his way down and spoke to the woman because she was pleasing to his eyes. And I'm going to explain the surrounding story, what comes next. So Samson returns to his home and later, on a later occasion, he's going down to Timnah to meet his uh, future wife for the actual marriage ceremony. So he goes and he meets them. And on the way, he sees the carcass of the lion and inside that carcass, is a swarm of bees and honey and he reaches into it and takes the honey and eats it gives it to his mother and father and then arrives at the wedding and there are 30 men in the wife's uh wedding party and he poses a riddle to them he says i'm going to give you a riddle if you solve it i'll give you 30 changes of clothes one for each actually two types of clothes for each of you However, if you can't solve it, then you have to do the same for me. And then he poses the riddle. Out of the eater comes something to eat. Out of the strong comes something sweet. Or powerful comes something sweet. And they're thinking about it for three days. They can't figure it out. Then they start to pester Samson's wife. Hey, give us the answer. Pester him. See if you can get the answer out of him. She cries on his shoulder. Please tell me, Samson. Don't you love me? And he's like, I haven't even told my mom and dad. Why would I tell you? Uh, and then finally, right before the seven days are over, he tells her. And she immediately goes, tells them. And they say, oh, well, what's stronger than a lion? And what's sweeter than honey? And he gets very mad because he knows they stole it through his wife. He gets so mad, in fact, that he goes and he kills 30 Philistines. He's marrying a Philistine woman. And he brings back the clothes from them and gives it to the other Philistines in the wedding party. And then he goes home. That is a terrible story. 
This is a terrible man. <laughs> and it's in the word. And we know that the word is holy, or we say it. But sometimes when we read stories like this, we think, how can this be the word of the Lord? And it says that the spirit of the Lord came on him, right? And that he was moved to marry a Philistine so that the Lord could conquer them and relieve Israel of their rule because the Philistines were at that time ruling. Now, it is uh, on the surface, it seems that Samson and the Lord Jesus Christ are as opposite as could be, right? Samson is violent, but the Lord is peace itself. Samson is rash, the Lord is complete self-control. Samson is a sinner, a murderer. The Lord was perfect, never sinned. Samson was senseless and just impulsively acted, whereas the Lord is wisdom itself. Samson is destructive, and the Lord is healing and life itself. Yet there are some things in common. There are some things in common. Let me read to you the very first part of the story of Samson, Judges 13. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Did you see the parallels? An angel appearing to a woman and saying, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and he will deliver Israel. You see those parallels later on, which we'll read in Delilah, who becomes Samson's lover, is bribed with silver to betray Samson, just as Judas was bribed with silver to betray the Lord. And finally, Samson, the word Samson means son man, the son man. And we know that the Lord is the son of heaven. And that's even stated in the Old Testament, right? The sun will rise with healing in his wings. So Samson's name itself means what the Lord is, the source of all life. Now let me read to you Luke 1, 5, and listen for parallels of Samson's story with this, which is John the Baptist. Luke 1, 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. Elizabeth was barren, and they both were advanced in years. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. A lot of parallels there too. And we know that John represents a certain quality of the Lord. And that is the natural. And we know that the word is the Lord. And the natural sense of the word is represented by John. So really John is an element of the Lord, of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is the inner, sweet, beautiful moving meaning john is that wild external sense the samson stories all these crazy stories in the word right and just as samson just as samson is moved to deliver israel and john is moved to prepare israel for deliverance so the external word is essential it is needed now Another parallel between the Lord and Samson is that they're both tragic heroes, right? Heroes in their own way. They both die in the act 
of their purpose. Um, so this riddle, out of the eater comes something to eat, and out of the strong something to sweet. This riddle is not just posed to the Philistines, but also to us. And if we crack this riddle, the spiritual sense of the riddle, not just a carcass with honey in it, then we will see the meaning of this story, and it will reveal itself to us in a way that truly is astounding, is mighty like Samson, and delivers us from our internal Philistines like Samson. In this way, the word does what it describes. Whenever that happens, and I'm sure it happens in every single verse, but whenever we catch a glimpse that, wait, this story is doing to me exactly what it's describing in the internal sense, it really blows your mind. And no human being can write a book like that. And additionally, this story clearly is predicting the Lord. So it's not only predicting what it will do in our life, which is mind-blowing, it predicts the Lord's coming, which is equally mind-blowing, which makes us one step closer to being able to believe that, yes, the natural sense of the word really is divine. Really is divine. Now, the Philistines represent a certain type of, or a certain result of our selfishness, our self-centeredness, our desire to serve ourselves, our desire to see life from our own perspective, our desire to govern our own life, and that is called faith alone. Faith alone is derived from that. Philistines are faith alone. Faith alone wants us to not be bound to the natural. We don't want to have to act out the word's commandments in the natural. And what that really starts to be is we don't want to have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because if we do, then we have to do what he says. And if we do that, then we want to not have to believe that the word is holy. So we're cutting off the holiness of the word and the holiness of the Lord, and the holiness of acting with love in this natural world. And that's faith alone, cutting all of those things off, all those forms of the natural. Now, to see the story of Samson and the whole word in, in its truth, we have to align ourselves in the right direction to see it properly. Have any of you seen these pieces of art which are made in objects in three dimensions? And from one angle, if you walk into the room, it'll just look like a mess of objects, a lamp, a desk, and everything. But if you walk to this side of the room and you look at it, all these objects suddenly converge and you see a face, you see a human being. And it's really amazing. That's like the word. And we have to find a way to see the word at that right angle where it suddenly starts to shine. And that right angle is love. We look at it with love, but we also look at it saying, this is the Lord's love. Somehow buried deep in this strange story of violence, violence commanded by the Lord, in fact, is the Lord's love. And if we have the faith enough to look at it that way and to try, and to know that this is love and I'm going to give it my love, then everything converges and suddenly light shines out of it. I'm going to read chapter 16. Samson covers four chapters. And there's a bunch of violence in between, which I'm skipping, but here's chapter 16. This is the last chapter. I should have preached about the wind this week instead of last week. All right, afterward it happened, this is a long story, so it's going to be a, a long reading. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, entice him and find out where his great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, 
And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So she's going to get a lot of money for this. And again, we see that the men are tempting her who's connected to him to betray him. Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and, and with what you may be bound to afflict you. It's <laughs> pretty obvious. And Samson said to her, if, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not dried, then I will become weak and be like any other man. And then they bind him while he sleeps and says he just breaks it off like a piece of flax touched to a flame. And he begs again, and he says, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I will become weak and be like any other man. So they bind him in ropes while he sleeps, and when he wakes up, he just snaps them off like threads, it says. And then he, she begs again. Uh, Samson doesn't seem very intelligent, does he? <laughs> if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, then I will be weak like any other man. So they do that while he sleeps. He gets up and he walks away with the loom in tow. <laughs> and it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. But he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor ever has come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. And if I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and become like any other man. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he came, became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. So it happened when their hearts were merry, all the Philistines are having a big party in their temple to Dagon. I, and the, now they're dancing and singing and who knows, maybe drinking. And their hearts are merry. And when that happened, they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support this temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. So we see in another parallel with the Lord right here. The Lord said in John 2, that early, second chapter of John, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And the disciples did not understand until he had died and rose again and they knew he meant the temple of his body. Now we know that the body of the Lord is the church in the human race, the Lord's presence in the human race. And then we begin to see what this whole Samson story is about. The Lord, when we start to have a corruption inside of us, and we're using the word not because we want to live it out, not because we love it, but it's sort of entertaining, right? We bring it in to entertain us. We have severed it from our lives as holy. We have severed the Lord from our life as actually being God. 
Jesus Christ is God, the word is holy. These are tough elements of faith. They just are. It's hard to sustain that belief. And it's because of our ego, our selfishness. It wants to cut these things off, and it can't see the holiness of them. And so we keep with the word, but it just becomes sort of entertainment, right? And when we gouge out the eyes of the Lord, it means when we separate the Lord from ourselves, then we are the ones who are blind, right? We are the ones who aren't seeing, because we need the Lord's vision in us to see things properly. So this story is about the Lord saying, I'm going to destroy this corruption that is destroying you. It's blinding you. It's doing in. It's giving you your death. I'm going to destroy that so I can raise up a new church where there is love. And we know what that new church looks like. It's described in the last two chapters of Revelation. It's an image of utter beauty, of harmony of all things. So we begin to see how the Lord knits together this internal sense and the natural sense. And how inside that terrible natural sense, that terrible man Samson, the Lord's love shines through. Out of the strong comes something sweet. Out of the eater comes something to eat. I want to talk about Delilah now. Here's another thing that just blows your mind, crushes that temple. Delilah's name means something hanging. But let me tell you the uses that it had in ancient Hebrew. It meant a well when the bucket is hanging halfway between the water and the people who are thirsty. Isn't this story exactly what that is? It's bringing up the water, the truth of the Lord, and restoring us with its quenching water. And it also means the limp pieces of yarn hanging out of a loom, which we see imaged in this very story. And it also means a lock of hair that's hanging limp. Isn't that amazing? So even the literal sense, if we knew Hebrew, is saying the human race is the hair of Samson. We are the embodiment. We are the vessel through which the Lord can express his love and truth to one another. But when we try to cut off having to believe that the word is holy or that Jesus Christ is the natural incarnation of the one and only God of heaven and earth, then what's really happening is we are cutting ourselves off from the body of the Lord. And the weakness of Samson is the weakness of the Lord in our own perception. Of course, the Lord can't be injured, but we sever ourselves off, and we are the one who becomes weak, a limp-hanging strand of hair. I think that's amazing. Now, we again, we want to be able to extract what's lovely from the word and say, okay, I got it. I'm meant to love. I'm meant to be honest. I'm meant to not hurt anybody. These are the essential things. I'm just going to run with that. You know, believing in Jesus Christ actually separates me from people like Jews and atheists. They don't understand. If I just go with the es essence, love, honesty, then I'll be able to do more good. So there's things like humanism, deism, um, theosophy, and undefined vague spirituality. These are attempts to do that. The problem is that they are severed from the source of love. They're severed from God, like that hair. And they will fall down weak. Because we cannot sustain selfless love without having an anchor in the Lord. How do we keep loving someone who is cruel to us unless we know that the Lord loves us intensely? 
that he laid down his life for us and that he wrote a letter to us and he is that letter so that we can know him we can't it's impossible for the human being separated from god to sustain love because the lord is love and i can attest to this from life and i think we all can but if we don't have the lord in our life we just can't sustain love we can't i remember in college i kept flip-flopping should i be christian or should i just be a humanist because i don't want to be separated from people who aren't christians a lot of my friends were Jewish and some were atheists. I didn't want to be separate from them. But what I found is I just can't continue to love unless I know that I am loved that deeply. Unless I know there's a providence that's guiding all things. Unless I know that everyone is an angel in the making. All these truths from the word are what enable and empower me to love. All of us to love. So we become a strand of weak, powerless hair when we cut ourselves off from that which the Lord describes himself in, the natural sense of the word, all three testaments, and the natural living Lord in our actions, and the natural truth that Jesus Christ, the one in history who lived in Palestine, that that is God. Those are hard things, but without them we fall down. I want to read to you about the Lord's love. Listen to this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me as well. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I, that I am going. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and welcome you into my presence so that you may be where I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. In a little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. Peace I leave to you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. What gracious, beautiful words. That's the honey. But even inside that sweet honey, we see the challenges. We have to believe that the Lord is the way, the truth, and the life, that the Lord is the only way to know God, and that we have to obey his commandments. There are the challenges. In Samson, the sweetness is so cloaked. And yet, when we crack that riddle, it is so powerful. It's so powerful. It's like Samson, and it crushes that selfishness and that desire to run away from the Lord, like the temple, so that a new one can be built up, so that we can love again. And there's another element here. As I said, we are the vessels, the natural vessels for the Lord's love and truth in the natural level. When we look at one another, it's easy to see that external, the letter of the word that is rough, and hard hard to love and we want to cut out parts of it from our life we don't want to be associated with all the people sometimes we don't even want to be connected to anybody but again if we stand at that right angle people's lives look like a mess just a messy room but if we stand at the right angle where we are trying to love with the lord's love and we know that there is lord's love in there Suddenly things converge and we see that person's internal sense shining through. We are written into the word. We are in a sense the natural letter of the word because we are God's creation. He speaks us alive. But we sometimes are allowed to see into the spiritual sense of our lives. I want to give you an example. 
I was once communicating with a man who was in prison. He had committed a serious crime. He had trouble his whole life with the law and with interacting with other people. It would be very easy to write someone off. This guy is a mess. He's hopeless. Jail is where he's best. He belongs. It would be easy to say that I don't want this person in my life. He's violent. He's aggressive. Doesn't love me. But when this man told me his life story, I was moved to tears. I saw the spiritual meaning of his life. I saw the truth of his life. The first three and a half years of his life, he was shipped from foster home to foster home, I think 16 times. Can't remember the exact number. Some of those homes abused him and he lost his ability to trust in human beings and in authority. He had to protect himself. He put on a very thick wall. And then when somebody came into his life, his adopted parents who were loving, and he says they were loving, he couldn't connect to them. He was too wounded. You can see how easily a person like that, totally isolated from love, would become violent, would become a person who gets in trouble with the law and unfortunately would end up in jail when what that person really needs is for people to see that internal sense, the beauty and love of his life, the Lord in there, and understand him properly. And then it's easy to love a person like that. He needs re rehabilitation. I look forward to the day when we as a human race advance in how we treat criminals so that instead of giving them more trauma, which life in jail is. We learn how to rehabilitate them, to heal them. And the word is the way of healing. So in this story, we see that the lion, that strong is the ego, the selfishness. And in its death, we see the sweetness, the honey of the Lord's love. And this very story of Samson is also that lion and inside it, we see the Lord's love. The letter of the word is the lion, fierce, like John the Baptist, scary. It threatens us. It accuses us. And yet inside all of that is the sweetness of the Lord's love. Belief in the letter of the word. It's tough. It's challenging. The Lord's love is there. Belief in Jesus Christ is God. It's challenging. The Lord's love is in there. Life on earth, other people, challenging, strong. The Lord's love is in there. This story is about the Lord Jesus Christ saving the human race and the subsequent communion and union with the Lord. His hair growing back is the Lord saying, I still love you. I'm still with you. He's reuniting us with himself. This story blows the house away. It is so powerful. This story is the loving hand of the Lord reuniting himself to us through the word, reuniting us with the word. Because when a story does this, you got to believe. It's too, too amazing. Now, this story started in the town Zora, which means leprosy, a disease of the natural, right? The external, the skin, it's a disease. And Manoah, through whom Samson comes, means to rest, to be quiet, to be still. And that's how we access, access the power of the Lord in the Word. We put our ego at rest. We say, calm down, just be still. Let my heart and mind be still, and let me look with love at these stories and see what the Lord has to say. There are some wonderful quotes from the Third Testament, especially the Arcana, about Samson. Samson was powerful because of his hair, principally because he represented the Lord, 
who from the truth and the natural fought with the hells and subdued them. And this before he put on the divine good and truth, even to the natural man. This is true in history, and it's true with the Lord coming into our lives. It's tr just true in all levels. The power and strength of the Lord resides in that which is lowest. This was represented in the ancient church by the hair of the Nazarites, in which resided their strength, as is plain from Sam Samson. Nazarite-hood corresponded to the lowest level of good and truth, or good and truth in the lowest level. In the natural order, celestial and spiritual things follow one another in sequence and consequently exist together with one another. Things which follow in sequence finally come together on the last or lowest level where they exist side by side in the same order. This being so, the things existing together with one another, which are last, and this is following that description of Samson and the Lazarites. And lowest, last and lowest, serve those following one another in sequence, which are prior and higher, as corresponding supports on which they rest and are thereby preserved. We can't know all these beautiful things without the natural level of the word. Now I'm going to read to you, and this is the last I'll be saying. I know it's been a long, long one, but this story has so much in it. Those quotes, by the way, were from Arcana Celestia 3301 and 9836, and this is from 9528. Out of pure love, thus out of pure mercy, the Lord assumed the human and underwent the severest temptations, finally the passion on the cross, that he might save the human race, and therefore merit and righteousness are his. From all this, it is evident that the good of merit consists in mercy, Mercy being divine love directed towards those trapped in misery. The Lord underwent the severest temptations and thereby set heaven and hell in order. And he fought out of divine love to save those who receive him in love and faith. That's a description of the Samson story. That is the Samson story. Here's one last thing, 1813, Arcana Celestia. The Lord alone became righteousness for the whole human race. This may be seen from the fact that he alone fought from divine love, namely from love towards the whole human race, whose salvation was what in his combats he solely desired and burned for. He loved us with a crazy love, just as Samson loved Delilah with a stupid love. He knows we're treacherous. He knows we're going to fall. He knows we're going to try to sever him from our life over and over again. He doesn't care. He just wants to be with us. He just wants to save us. He burns for our salvation. 1690, I forgot one more. The whole of the Lord's life in this world from earliest childhood consisted in constant temptations and constant victory. The last was when on the cross he prayed for his enemies and so for all people in the whole world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.